some of the others, but uh, typically, typically Western Digitals is the one that's going to do that. And I'm not trying to pick on them because Seagate and Mac Store and all of them have their problems, and they're all going to die sooner or later. So it's not a, it's just going to happen sooner or later. Um, the other thing is too different OSs. You'd be really surprised. Like for instance, and I'm going to give you Mac guys a simple one here because this is not picking on you guys either because I got Macs and I love them too. But when a Mac partition gets corrupt or something happens to it, Mac software at repairing that sucks. It just it can't do it. Most of the time, it'll say, "Oh, linker error or something else," and it'll show up, or it just won't mount the drive. You can, and a lot of people that have Macs. Sometimes they only have a Mac, so their other computer might be a Mac too. So they take the hard drive out and they go over and they plug it into another Mac. That Mac's not going to see it either. Neither one of them's going to be able to see it. So I get those in for recovery all the time. And so uh, a lot of the guys who, because I do, um, if you call CompUSA or if you go to Micro Center or Pro On Site or a bunch of these other guys, we have deals with those guys because we don't typically market to the public. We make deals with those guys to send us their hard drives for repair. So if you call those guys, they're going to ship it to me. But the, the Apple guys at CompUSA will send me their hard drives. Most of the time, it's simple stuff. The hard drive itself hasn't actually died. There's not a problem with the drive. The drive itself is fine, but Mac can't read it. And the people who tried to do everything did it all on Macs. So you get a Windows box, you pay $49 for Mac Drive. Mac Drive will read the drive with the error, and it will just display a little box and says, this drive is set to read only because it has an error in it and blah, blah, blah. But it lets you go straight to all the files. You could just skip all that stuff, and so 49 bucks, you just solved your problem. All you got to do, though, you can't, you, know, you can't fix the problem, and you can't make it reboot. So what you've got to do is you've got to copy your files out, and then go back to your Mac and reinstall your OS, and then copy your files over. It's just a lot quicker, a lot shorter time to do a repair. And so 49 bucks, I just fixed most of your Mac problems right there. Um, and try different angles, upside down, sideways, things like that. It really does matter. If you flip a drive over, sometimes it'll run, amazingly enough. Um, it has a lot to do with uh, when it heats up and it expands and now the platter is in a certain space and it's hitting the you know, top of something, blah, blah, blah. If you flip it over, now it's got a little bit more momentum running in a different direction. So you want to try that before you go and open it. And you'd be surprised, again, persistence pays off. Sometimes you hook it up and you let it run for 10 hours and come back and it's working. So it's just pretty rare. So if that's your last chance, then try those things. And then fans and cooling trays. I'm going to show you something here I've been trying. Um, and I always pronounce this wrong as Peltier Cooler. Peltier Cooler. It's a ceramic cooling item. And basically, this one came out of a device you can buy for 20 bucks at CompUSA. This is that little USB cooler for your cup. You put your cup on it and it cools your cup off. Well, the components of it, if you try to order them, are probably going to cost you more money than that thing cost. So it has a heat sink in it and has everything that you need to go and do that. So you can buy that, take it apart, and this is what you're going to see inside. It already has a USB connector, so you already got your power. Um, when you plug this in, what's going to happen is one of these directions is going to be spitting off the heat. One section is going to suck the, the heat from one side and freeze whatever's on that side, basically, and spit it off on the other side. So you can take that and you assemble it. Like I put these in these metal trays like this. You guys have probably seen these if your modern systems are doing anything. You just put your hard drive in it because it basically becomes a heat sink while you're working on it. And you want to suck all the heat away from your drive as much as possible. And then put the drive in it. It's important, too, that you're making contact with the metal when you're using something like a Peltier cooler because it wants to touch that metal and suck it off. If you've got labels on your drive and you're sticking it right there, it's not going to really help you at all. It'll do a little bit, but it's not going to do a whole lot. But uh, typically, the Peltier coolers, the number of them that you use, can bring the temperature of the drive down to about 40 degrees. So you can actually run fairly cold while it's running. And then this is the heat sink came out of that same device, the, the cooler. And so I have the Peltier cooler right underneath it. And then you can use two or three of these in sequence, too. You can either put them side by side, but if you actually stack them like little cakes, it'll suck it off, and it'll get colder on the bottom one. So you can play around with some of that stuff just to keep it cold. But, so for 20 bucks and take your labels off and stick your stuff, you can probably keep your drive running fairly cold. Uh, the electronics, the board itself. If you touch this board in certain areas while it's running and you plug it into like a USB power adapter or whatever, and you, you can feel where extreme heat is on this. And a lot of times what will happen is when you, t when you touch at certain spots, you can actually find where the short is in this. So you already know, I got a short, something bad is happening here, and you can feel the heat up to a certain spot, and then it stops. It doesn't go to the other chips, and you don't feel it. And when I took the board off and I flipped it over, this is what I saw on the other side. So this is common. 
you would be surprised. Sometimes I see little diodes or things like that, but they fry. They smoke. Things happen. Sometimes they smell. But uh, you can basically take that board off, replace the board. The drive's in great shape. No problem with it. And actually, at that point in time, I haven't opened the drive. So just replacing the electronics on the board is fairly simple. There's four screws on the bottom of your board, and there's no soldering contacts or anything like that. It physically just contacts the drive. So there's nothing like loop back inside off of that board. It's four screws and some contact on the outside, powers up both the, the, the power for the motor and makes the contact for everything inside the hard drive itself. So that's a fairly simple thing to do and that's, that's always your first line of defense. Because no matter what you do after that, you're still going to have to buy a duplicate drive. You're going to have to get the exact drive and you're going to have to do everything else anyway. So you want to make sure that the new drive that you bought actually works so you power it up. Don't be so anxious to take the board off and go put it on your, your old drive. Make sure it's working, make sure the board works. Then take the board off, move it to the drive. Make sure that that's running. If, it, if you're lucky, it, you might just be done right there. You might get your whole coffee and you might be finished. Otherwise, you might not hear a motor spin up or you might not hear other things happening. And sometimes there's no way to test that motor easily without having that exact board either because you don't want to go playing around too much with voltages and things like that unless you want to spend some, some time sending it to a data recovery house. Um, so a head crash. Sometimes the head doesn't fall off like that. Sometimes it just hangs there and drags along the platter and does some more damage. But it's, uh, typically that's what we're looking at when we look at a head crash. So I actually replaced this one and got this drive back up and running. You can see, and you can see the reflection here is basically hanging and a uh, nice close-up of that. But uh, I replaced the head of that one and was able to recover the data off that drive and it worked just fine. The hardest part about this one was that the head actually parked on the inside of the platter instead of the outside of the platter, and I'll go into that in a few minutes. So you're replacing damaged heads. Now you can't go to, you know, Jensen and ask, "Hey, give me your head replacement kit." You're not going to get a head replacement kit. They don't know what you're talking about. There are no tools specifically made for doing this. There's probably only a handful of people who even try to do these kind of things. But uh, you're going to end up trying to make your own tools, and this is paper. This is a yellow post-it note, and you're going to fold it, and I'll show you how, how it holds them apart. But the whole point here is I'm lucky enough on this particular drive to have a ramp. And that's pretty much uh, on all the Hitachi slash IBM drives, there's going to be a ramp. Some of the Seagates and some of the Western Digitals have a ramp on the outside. That's really nice because this ramp basically holds the two heads apart, and you can keep the two heads lined up. And so your piece of paper here your whole point for that piece of paper is to hold these two pieces away from each other about the same configuration that they're in in the ramp so that when you slide it out that they don't touch each other. Once they touch each other and the two ends hit each other, it's a done deal. It's a lot easier if you've already taken out your good drive, uh, your old drive stuff first before you switch over from the new drive so you have some place to put it because you can't really sit these things down or anything. It'll take you about two hours to do a head replacement like this and you just have to be patient but if you're careful it'll work very well for you and you'll actually be able to read that data again. So you take the, you take the piece out of your old one. The only thing that's there is on this bottom piece right here before you take the head off. This piece has usually got a screw in it that goes through to the other side for the contacts for the IDE board. Once you remove that piece it's fairly easy to take it out, but you got to do a little bit of wiggling and jiggling just to get it right so that it comes out of the side and doesn't do any other damage while it's doing it. Um, and then once you line them up, and this is what it'll look like when you're actually moving it. You'll take paper and fold it. You'll keep them their distance apart. And this piece right here typically...